something happened in here. Something beyond our understanding at the moment. If I only knew where to begin. Quatermass is the name, Bernard Quatermass. And make not the mistake of addressing the gentleman as Quartermass, a commonplace mispronunciation, lest the cosmic balance of nature be thrown out of whack. In the realm of classic science fiction, the name of Quatermass symbolizes a defiance of cosmic imbalance in the face of a prehistoric and perpetual onslaught of alien disorder and mayhem. Descended from the ancient Normandy clan of Quatremares, or Four Ponds, the proper English name of Quatermass applies to the protagonist in the novelistic teleplays of Nigel Neal, who took his science fictional inspirations from ancient mythology and H.G. Wells, Neal's direct literary ancestor, in approximately equal measure. They've all gone. All gone. Yes. This is Mike Price speaking, author of the Forgotten Horrors series of movie history books and a follower of Nigel Neal's Quatermass films and their television origins over the long term. Neal's legacy is a self-contained and influential 20th century mythology deriving from prehistoric tribal legends of buried or forgotten menaces that may represent the very origins of humankind. Told you it was cosmic. In a post-World War II civilization that had dedicated its energies to the progressive exploration or hopeful colonization and exploitation of outer space, Neil depicted a cosmos better left unexplored lest outside forces intrude to wreak havoc. Gaze not into the abyss, lest the abyss gaze back. This is the BBC Light Programme. Before the late news summary, here is a special item. Just over one hour ago, a British-made rocket vehicle, the first ever to have succeeded in reaching outer space, made a safe crash landing in the area of Wimbledon Common. Even while his American contemporary, Ray Bradbury, encouraged space exploration with the recurring chant of Ad Astra, that's bumper sticker Latin for Onward to the Stars, Nigel Neal took the opposing stance with his Quatermass allegories. Better humankind steer clear of the abyss which may be standing by with invading forces at the ready. Even Bradbury acknowledged the possibility of menacing interstellar life but Neil followed H.G. Wells' invasive predictions to the extremes of intimate and hostile encounters. Brother, that's really something. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened in our time. By contrast, Bradbury's 1953 scenario for It Came From Outer Space acknowledges conflict but concedes merely that the time is not right for any closer encounters. Neal's contrarian position had descended from H.G. Wells' 1895 novel, The War of the Worlds, whose first motion picture adaptation in 1953 coincided approximately with Neal's original The Quatermass Experiment, produced as a television serial for the British Broadcasting Corporation. These dramatizations stood at odds with director Jack Arnold's It Came From Outer Space, with its basis in Bradbury's alien tolerant attitude. Victor. Victor, do you remember now? You must. Bring something back. Neil's Professor Bernard Quatermass is a heroic but tormented scientist, champion of space exploration for the British Experimental Rocket Group. Quatermass had arisen from Neil's interest in such influential speculative writers as George Orwell, John Osborne, H.G. Wells, and Susan Hill. Neil found his ideal writerly outlet as a developer of teleplays for the BBC, beginning in 1946 on radio, branching into television in 1951, and remaining affiliated over the longer term. The original The Quatermass Experiment was broadcast in six half-hour episodes 
during July and August of 1953. The teleplay confronts Quatermass with the consequences of his sending the first crewed mission into space, where a ghastly fate befalls the crew and only one returns, altered in mind and body. The production proved a far cry from the space cadet type of juvenile science fiction teleplays that proliferated on American commercial television of the post-World War II years. England's Museum of Broadcast Communications has hailed the program's new range of fears about Britain's post-war and post-colonial security. Keep back there, will you? They're reporting about this. Here, is it true the bomb disposal people are on their way over here to de it? Neil made Quatermass a Manx man like himself. Many ancestral names from the Isle of Man begin with Q-U and chose the given name in recognition of the astronomer Bernard Lovell. Quatermass, it's true to say, isn't it, that this atomic rocket, the very first of its kind, is a tremendous technical advance. Well, yes, I dare say we have surprised a few people. Oh, I should say so, indeed. It's designed and built entirely by British brains and muscle. And now, Professor, uh, can you tell us something about the crew? Well, it's, uh, we shan't know that for a few hours. Well, no, sir, I, I meant some personal details. Who are oh, they exactly? I'm sorry. The popular success of that first Quatermass foreshadowed the arrival of commercial television in England. The UK's controller of programs, Cecil McGivern, declared, we are going to need many more Quatermass experiment programs. The original Quatermass experiment was presented in vivo, live from the studio. Only the first two episodes were tele-recorded. They survive as tantalizing fragments in the BBC archives. What went on here? What did it do to them? By 1955, Hammer Film Productions had developed a feature-length adaptation titled The Quatermass Experiment in an attempt to exploit the British Board of Film Censors X certificate rating, the X symbolizing horrific subject matter. Nigel Neal spoke distastefully of the Hammer version, particularly in the casting of Brian Donlevy as Quatermass. Donlevy's starring presence was a condition imposed by an American producer-investor Robert L. Lippert, whose presence assured the Quatermass experiment of U.S. distribution. Would a hospital know what goes on out there in, in space? On the other side of the air, there's a whole new world out there, a wilderness, uncharted. And he's been there and come back. A sensationalized new title, The Creeping Unknown, was inflicted for the American box office. Now, Brian Donlevy had played a Quatermass-type character in an American cautionary film of 1947, The Beginning or the End, concerning the development of nuclear warfare, and Robert Lippert considered the lapsed Hollywood leading man an ideal selling point. If the Quatermass experiment were to find an audience outside England, Neil would have preferred a genuinely English, that is, Oxfordian, actor. There's no room for personal feelings in science, Judith. Some of us have a mission. You should be very proud to have a husband who's willing to risk his life for the betterment of the whole world. What world? Your world? The world of Quatermass. Nigel Neal found Donlevy too blustery. Hardly a dynamic man of science, he said, such as I had envisioned. Such distaste aside, the film registered as a popular success and promptly engendered a sequel, likewise with Donlevy. Neil already had contributed a television sequel, Quatermass II, whose arrival in 1955 formed the basis for the second such theatrical production from Hammer. A prototype of the nuclear motor designed to power the Quatermass II rocket has gone into a runaway reaction, ending in a disastrous explosion. The televised Quatermass II, in a recurring collaboration with BBC director Rudolf Cartier, would be Neil's final assignment as a staff writer after five years with the BBC. Quatermass II would become Neil's first overtly political script, provoked by his hostility to Great Britain's Official Secrets Act and its cover-ups for the Ministry of Defense. Though required to sign the Official Secrets Act on account of his BBC standing, Neil showed his resistance in the depiction of a top-secret manufacturing plant that proves to harbor 
the basis of an alien invasion. Probably suffering from shock. How he was in the car. Better get you two into my car. No, I can manage. Just take him and help us into the car. No sooner had he left the BBC than Neil adapted Quatermass 2 as a motion picture for Hammer Films. Producer Anthony Hines and director Val Guest had supervised the first Quatermass film spinoff, on which Neil had been unable to work because of his BBC staff contract. Neil's disappointment with the return of Brian Donlevy was tempered by a favorable review of the big screen version in the Times of London. The infection must be wearing off leaving them, perhaps all of them. By May of 1957, Neil had rejoined the BBC on an ad hoc contractual basis, commissioned to write a third Quatermass TV serial. Quatermass and the Pit was broadcast during 1958-1959. Neil had drawn the inspiration from England's Notting Hill racial tensions of 1958, sensing an element of genocide. Neil responded with a tale in which ancient legends of hauntings would reveal a hidden history of Martian colonization of Earth and genetic tampering with the human species. The influence of H.G. Wells is patent in Quatermass and the Pit, as suggested in Wells' 1936 novel, The Croquet Player, with its tale of a grisly ghost from prehistoric times intruding upon polite English society. The British Film Institute has hailed Quatermass and the Pit in times more recent for its confrontations with man's hostile nature and the military's perversion of science. Ceramic material of some kind resistant to heat to up to over 3,000 degrees, harder than diamond. That's what every rocket engineer has been searching for. Though insistent that he had by now exhausted the character of Bernard Quatermass, Neil retained a fascination with the concept and would return to Quatermass over the long term. The scenes you are about to see are more incredible than anything today's science or fiction ever imagined. By 1961, while juggling projects for Hammer Films, Neil had begun to adapt Quatermass and the Pit as a feature-length motion picture. The gradual development finally saw release in 1967, with Roy Ward Baker directing for full measure of cosmic horror, emphasizing Neil's fears of ethnic cleansing as a condition of alien colonization. Then in 1972, a false start on a new Quatermass BBC serial ran afoul of budgetary restrictions and the unavailability of the Stonehenge Monument as a principal shooting location. When next seen on screen for Thames Television in 1979's The Quatermass Conclusion, or Quatermass 4, a since-retired Quatermass, now played by Sir John Mills, revisits London to find society collapsed by a new alien threat. He responds fatalistically with a nuclear counterattack. Herewith, the feature film chronicles of Professor Bernard Quatermass. Three astronauts have been launched aboard a rocket dispatched by Professor Quatermass. The ship returns with only one crewman, Victor Caroon, played by Richard Wordsworth, aboard. Caroon, in a state of shock, begins to mutate into an alien organism which threatens to contaminate civilization. Anyway, here on the shoulder. Feel it. It's swollen. Quatermass and a Scotland Yard agent, Lomax, Jack Warner, must disable the menace. <laughs> Brian Donlevy's blustery portrayal of Quatermass is often overshadowed by Richard Wordsworth, 
and his wordless eloquence as the infected crewman. His gaunt face and shifting physical structure convey a feral quality reminiscent of Boris Karloff's 1931 portrayal of the Frankenstein monster. Very much like you stay. You look so tired. There's plenty if that's what you're worried about. And cakes, too. Karun's assigned physician, David King Wood, appears more interested in Karun as a specimen. Karun's wife, Judith Margia Dean, demands a conventional hospital treatment. Everything's going to be all right, Victor. I'll get you the best treatment, the finest doctors. I'll get you well and strong. We'll make a new life for ourselves. Inspector Lomax collects forensic evidence of a subhuman presence. Onboard motion picture footage from the rocket depicts a horrific, however cryptic, experience for the three astronauts. Karun mutates into a murderous hybrid of plant and animal, absorbing citizens and other creatures along the way, while leaving his wife in a traumatized condition. Quatermass realizes that the organism will release reproductive spores. Uh, there's an emergency. You saw it? We don't know what it is. Same pattern as the one in the lab. Only it was 20 times the pattern of reproduction. Those nodules, if they get to spore this time, nothing will stop them. In a confrontation atop a scaffolding at Westminster Abbey, Quatermass orders that the creature be incinerated in a surge of electricity. Asked what he intends next, Quatermass replies, I'm going to start again. I am going to start again. As if in further reply, a second manned rocket takes off for the great unknown. The BBC had sold the motion picture rights for 500 pounds. Neil was left out of the transaction, being a work-for-hire employee of the BBC, although his authorship was at length recognized with an overdue token payment of 3,000 pounds. Director Val Guest welcomed the opportunity to branch out from an early specialty in comedy. While prizing ominous mood over an outright horrific approach, Guest took a documentary-style cinema verite approach, emphasizing handheld camera movement and pressing the actors to deliver conversational line readings, often overlapping their statements and speaking in seemingly spontaneous bursts. Inspector, get this place closed, get everybody out of here. Right, as quickly and quietly as possible. No panic, no excitement. Close yes, the whole place up, but we've already roped the areas Listen, off. Listen, so you've got to yeah. take it from us. We know what we're doing. Just tell your men to cooperate. This is going all over English. Son, it's an emergency. Get this stopped. Stopped? I can't stop it. Where's your producer? It's on the truck. Hidden under layers of paint and aged by the dust of time. The influence of Howard Hawke's approach to the thing from another world, from 1951, is evident in the naturalistic manner of speaking. All done, Pat. You get everything? Yeah, we burned everything in Carrington's lab and in the greenhouse. Burnt the arm, too. Nothing left but ashes. How is Dr. Carrington? He's got a broken collarbone and a bad headache. The especially built settings, including a convincing Westminster Abbey, dovetail persuasively with the extensive location shooting. The creature makeup and prosthetic effects find artist Phil Leakey and cinematographer Walter J. Harvey emphasizing Richard Wordsworth's naturally gaunt facial contours, accentuated by a pulsating artificial arm. James Bernard's orchestral score is remarkable in its use of string section dissonances to convey menace, an emphatic foreshadowing of Bernard Herrmann's use of shrieking violins and violas for Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho from 1960. James Bernard got there first, and in the process would become Hammer's busiest film score composer over the long stretch.
Quatermass 2, 1957, shown in America as Enemy from Space. The formal sequel depicts Professor Bernard Quatermass's investigation of rampant meteorite landings in the Winterton Flats region of England. He finds an immense industrial plant which eerily resembles his own models for a proposed moon colony. This top secret facility represents a conspiracy involving an alien infiltration of the British government. That's funny. I thought I felt a sort of... Put it down. A sort of vibration. <coughs> Marsh, your face. There was something on your face. Are you all right? Let me take a look. You know, for a moment, I could have sworn I saw something that looked like a big black bubble. Quatermass, Brian Donlevy again, struggles to regain traction for his space exploration programs. He and a colleague, Marsh, Brian Forbes, travel to remote Winterton Flats where they find the industrial outpost along with an unbroken meteorite. The object releases a gas which leaves Marsh with a V-shaped blotch. Armed guards sporting similar scars arrive and abduct Marsh, driving Quatermass away. <laughs> Inspector Lomax, played now by John Longdon, connects Quatermass with Vincent Broadhead, Tom Chato, a member of Parliament who has challenged a veil of secrecy surrounding the tax dollar funding of Winterton Flats. On a guided tour of the complex, which purportedly manufactures synthetic food, Broadhead steals into one of the industrial domes and emerges covered in a poisonous slime. It burns. This is the food. And it burns. You like it. No, no, don't touch me. Quatermass ditches the scene under fire. The professor articulates a belief that the plant is indeed manufacturing food, though not for human consumption. Its purpose is to incubate alien creatures. Don't quite Could you call an emergency action on a large scale that it have to be? Action for what? An action if I told you that what is really being carried out in Winterton Flats is the mass destruction of men's minds. Lomax finds that the commissioner of police now bears that same V-shaped mark. A journalist, Jimmy Hall, played by Sidney James, investigates. A hostile reception awaits for the locals at Winterton Flats prove unquestioningly loyal to their factory bosses without suspecting the deeper nature of their jobs. Newly arrived meteorites crash into the community center, afflicting a barmaid, Vera Day. Armed guards assassinate Hall as he seeks to file a dispatch. <laughs> Now angered, the villagers march upon the factory. Quatermass, Lomax, and the villagers barricade themselves inside a pressurized chamber. Now certain that the alien colonizers are attempting to terraform the environment, for the planet's natural atmosphere is toxic to them, Quatermass sabotages their life support mechanism with an infusion of oxygen suffocating the invaders. Simultaneously at Quatermass's rocket base, an assistant, William Franklin, launches a nuclear missile against an invader's satellite before he can be gunned down by mind-controlled troopers. The dying aliens merge into immense creatures which collapse from exposure to the atmosphere. Look at them, the things! The afflicted humans revert to normalcy. Lomax ponders the futility of filing a final report. You know what worries me? How am I gonna make a final report about all this? What worries me is how final can it be? Hammer Films had planned a feature film adaptation before the television sequel could be broadcast. The BBC allowed Nigel Neal to condense his teleplay into a screenplay with guidance by Hammer producer Anthony Hines and further tightening by director Val Guest to simplify the climactic destruction of the invaders' asteroid outpost. Don't shoot! Hold your fire! Wait! Crazy mess! 
The cruelties of the Winterton Flats guards are depicted in more sadistic detail in the BBC TV version. Neil remained critical of Brian Donlevy's reading of Quatermass, assuming but not affirming a drunken condition. Guest persisted in championing Donlevy's brusque and efficient portrayal. What's this? A safety precaution. On a personal note, I should mention that I first saw Quatermass II in a West Texas theater at the city of Amarillo, where the eastern horizon was dominated by an ominous and mysterious factory shrouded in federal secrecy. It was an open secret, rather, that this Pantex plant was a manufacturing site for nuclear warheads, ground zero for the Cold War. Ordinary civilians held the place in an awe quite like that reserved for the outpost of Winterton Flats in Quatermass II. Visitors were discouraged, though of course not subjected to alien possession. When Quatermass II was syndicated for television play during the early 1960s, the Amarillo Chamber of Commerce sought to discourage the local ABC TV station from showing the film, lest new comparisons be drawn with Pantex Plant. Box office returns for Quatermass II proved robust, but Hammer's larger commercial success with 1957's The Curse of Frankenstein diverted the studio's attention to a dawning series of gothic horror pictures. Ten years would pass before Hammer would tackle a third entry, Quatermass and the Pit. The gathering darkness of Quatermass II is helped along immensely by a more generous budget and by the intense cloudscape photography of Gerald Gibbs. The ominous Winterd and Flats factory is an oil refinery in Essex along the Thames estuary. Its desolate appearance came naturally for the plant was minimally staffed, simplifying Val Guest's staging while accommodating a spectacular running gun battle toward the climax. Effects artists added the immense incubation domes with matte paintings. Production designer Bernard Robinson would remain with Hammer for many further productions. James Bernard's urgent musical score lends tension throughout. descend into the pit of hell as you share their horror. Listen, I'm advising you all to leave. There may be grave danger. I tell you, this could be dangerous. Get back! Get back! Flash forward then to 1967 and the belated third feature film adaptation, Quatermass and the Pit. Nigel Neal's self-adapted screenplay, essentially faithful to the BBC production, concerns the discovery of ancient human remains at the site of a subway extension. These fossils prove, I firmly believe, that creatures essentially resembling mankind walked this earth as long ago as five million years. Ghostly life force apparitions become manifest and space scientist Bernard Quatermass engages in a clash with military interests as to the significance of the discovery. Within 10 years, there will be permanent bases on the moon, perhaps even on Mars. Military bases? Of course. Neil drops a significant clue to his inspiration by designating the accursed site as Hobbs End, a variation on an ancient place that had been known as Hobbs Lane. Hob being an antiquated name for devil, as in Hobgoblin. In H.G. Wells' 1936 novel, The Croquet Player, a similarly bedeviled location bears the name of Cain's Marsh, or Cain's Marsh, an allusion to the first biblical murder. What was once a sort of nickname for the devil? While Wells' concern lay with a prehistoric haunting, or residual life force, and its intrusions upon modern-day civilization, 
Neil established his apparitions as a vestige of ancient genetic tampering by colonizing Martians. Quatermass in the Pit argues that the human species owes its existence to a prehistoric infiltration. An excavation at Hobbs End turns up a skull. Paleontologist Matthew Roney, James Donald, identifies the skull as a five million year old ape man, more ancient by far than known discoveries. They were earthly creatures as much as you or I. They were our remote ancestors, but they themselves had ancestors going back as far as 30 million years. A near impervious metallic object found buried nearby is mistaken for an unexploded bomb from the Nazi Blitz of London. The army imposes its will. Meanwhile, Professor Bernard Quatermass, now played by Andrew Keir, learns of a new conflict. His plans for a settlement on the moon have been co-opted by the military, which plans missile bases. Quatermass regards Colonel Breen, Julian Glover, assigned to hijack Quatermass's rocket group, as a threatening annoyance. I told you I had an explanation. The Germans in 1944. Oh, Breen, you can't still be hanging on to that. Professor Quatermass, you are an expert in certain fields, I in others. One of my specializations is weapons and another military propaganda, so kindly allow me my opinion without interrupting. The bomb disposal team enlists Breen. Breen concludes the buried object is a relic of World War II. Quatermass disagrees. When another skull is found within the purported bomb, Quatermass and Roney realize that the object itself must be five million years old. Noting the resistance to heat, Quatermass suggests an alien origin. Roney is certain the ape man remains are terrestrial. Roney's assistant, Barbara Judd, Barbara Shelley, a prominent hammer contractee, recalls that hob is an archaic devilish term. A desolate house near the station is rumored to be haunted. A bomb squad crewman sees an apparition of Roney's ape man. Research turns up historical accounts of spectral appearances, all coinciding with disturbances of the ground around Hobbs End. Uh, in the winter of the year 1341, the religious of that region did strive against an outbreak of evil at Hobbs Lane. A fault in the bomb-like object reveals three insectoid carcasses, patently alien. Quatermass and Roney consider a similarity to superstitious images of the devil. Quatermass concludes that the bomb-shaped craft is the source of the disturbances. Quatermass theorizes that the insect-like occupants of the spaceship had come from a dying Mars seeking to transfer their intelligence to the indigenous primitive humanoids. Descendants of these altered ape men would have evolved into humans, retaining a subconscious Martian essence. A crewman, Sladden, Duncan Lamont, is overwhelmed by a psychic force. Shaken by the telekinetic blast, Sladden tells of a vision of insect-like hordes, fancying himself as one of the creatures. Barbara Judd is similarly affected, and Quatermass records her mental impulses to show what he calls a genocidal race purge. A fallen cable electrifies the craft, spreading the long dormant Martian impulse to create a homicidal rampage among the locals. Breen is roasted alive. Quatermass falls under alien control, but is brought back to reality by Roney, who appears immune. My name is Bernard Quatermass, I'm professor of physics. Control the British experimental group. At present engaged. Engaged. <laughs> An apparition of a Martian looms over London, embodying the mythological image of a devil. Oh, I'm sorry, something's wrong here. Now nah, nah, they're gonna muck it up. Any noises? Vision on sound, that's all. Have another drink. Roney seeks to discharge the demonic image by grounding its electrical essence. 
His ploy works, but Roni is killed in the resulting conflagration. The alien energy dissipates, leaving Quatermass and Barbara Judd to survey the wreckage. Neil had completed a tentative screenplay for Quatermass and the Pit during 1961. Assuming the continuing presence of Val Guest as director and dreading the continuing presence of Brian Donlevy in the title role. Corporate intrigues complicated the process into 1966 when a new international distribution arrangement enabled the start of production. Scott's actor Andrew Kier, ideally cast in Neil's opinion, replaced Don Levy, although Kier was intimidated by a paranoid presumption that the new director, Roy Ward Baker, considered him unsuited. Baker, however, professed delight with Kier's performance. Production designer Bernard Robinson and effects chief Les Bowie developed the otherworldly look of the Hobbs Inn setting, including a nightmarish fantasia depicting the Martian race massacre. Tristan Carey's musical score combines electronic instrumental sounds with conventional orchestral scoring. Quatermass and the Pit has remained an influential film with a particular bearing upon such homage pictures of the 1980s as John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness and Toby Hooper's Life Force. It'll come again. It'll take us too. Soon. We're waiting. Soon. We won't be long. Soon. We're coming out of all the blackness of this world. Soon. Neil did eventually write a fourth Quatermass story, broadcast as a four-part serial, titled Quatermass, or Quatermass 4, by ITV Television in 1979. A recut edition called The Quatermass Conclusion received limited theatrical play. But and now, a father figure of space research, Professor Bernard Quatermass. And cut to two. Good. Sir, Good. after Good. all these shocks and setbacks of your own career, what are your thoughts now? I'm ashamed to think that I might have contributed in any way to this disgusting charade. Quatermass, or the Quatermass Conclusion, 1979, also known as Quatermass 4. More a television serial than a feature film, though cinematically conceived and photographed, this fourth Quatermass finds Nigel Neal revisiting his celebrated rocket scientist character, played now by Sir John Mills. Influenced by youth rebellion movements of the 1960s and 1970s, the production has as much in common with such youth quake movies as Joseph Losey's These Are the Damned from 1962. No. Don't ever do that again, Johnny. I'll do what I like, King. Do you think I'll let a man put his dirty hands on you? Peter Watkins' Privilege, 1967, and Barry Shears' Wild in the Streets, 1968, as with Neil's own body of work. Neil wrote the teleplay in two versions, a four-episode serial and a hundred-minute feature. Quatermass 4 pivots on a cult, the planet people, that gathers at prehistoric sites, anticipating teleportation to some cosmic destination. Professor Bernard Quatermass, searching for his wayward granddaughter, Hetty Carlson, played by Rebecca Sayre, witnesses a mass disappearance. It develops that the planet people are being preyed upon by some alien life-absorbing force. They did it! They got away! They've all gone! <laughs> Quatermass, long since retired to Scotland, revisits London to find the city in apocalyptic decay. The destruction of two international spacecraft prompts an investigation by Quatermass and an astronomer, Joe Capp, played by Simon McCorkendale. We got a sniper here. Really? You want to chance it? Yes. That way then, and make it fast. An overwhelming signal from space coincides with the spaceship incident. 
Quatermass suspects that his granddaughter has become a pawn of the planet people. Quatermass, Cap, and Cap's wife, Claire, Barbara Kellerman, find a group of planet people assembled at a megalithic site, suddenly absorbed by a burst of light. The chief cultist, Ralph Arliss, fancies his followers transported, but Quatermass knows the fanatics have been vaporized. An injured survivor, Isabel, played by Annabel Lanyon, speaks in a delirium of what she calls lovely lightning. Can you locate Bernard Quatermass? Well, he's here. What? You mean he's with you? That's great. Put him on. Hello, Bernard. <coughs> Hello, Chuck. A NASA scientist, Tony Sebald, determines that thousands of young people have vanished at similarly ancient sites. As unrest spreads and Quatermass is abducted, Cap is horrified to see a beam of radiance striking at his home. Children. Children! <laughs> Quatermass is rescued by a group of aged derelicts. At a hospital, Isabel levitates and disintegrates. Thuggish youth gangs infiltrate the planet people. Quatermass concludes that the menace is not some cosmic intelligence, but rather a device designed to harvest human flesh. A beam of light stretches from deep space to the Earth, just missing the mob. A second beam destroys that gathering. Meanwhile, a massed faction of planet people gathers at Wembley Stadium. Quatermass proves powerless to prevent the self-destructive gathering, but he survives by clinging to an underground wall. Tens of thousands have died in the stadium, their powdered remains filling the sky with a greenish haze. The planet people thwart Cap's attempts to contact the alien presence, hoping to conscript Cap. A Soviet envoy, Gurov, played by Brewster Mason, helped Quatermass to lure the otherworldly force to Cap's observatory, where a nuclear detonation awaits. I know what evil is. That's evil. A planet people zealot, Kickalong, Ralph Arliss, kills Cap. A heart attack sidelines Quatermass just as he faces a reunion with his granddaughter. Hetty joins Quatermass in a suicidal ploy to detonate the bomb, driving away the invasion force. The message was taken. It has not come again. We pray it will never come again. Long in development, Quatermass 4 was thwarted early on in 1973 by the government's refusal to allow filming at Stonehenge, the prehistoric megalithic structure at England's Salisbury Plain, which had become a big business tourist trap. The BBC brass found Neil's scenario too fatalistic for popular consumption, but retained its option until 1975, preventing further development in the meantime. Then in 1977, Thames Television picked up the option, accepting Neil's suggestion to remove a decisive scene from Stonehenge to the more accessible Wembley Stadium. Neil found the Thames TV plan to be by far more accommodating, given a truer cinematic scope with the use of 35mm film and utilizing more expansive shooting locales. Neil wrote at the time, Quatermass 4 is a story of the future, meaning a very near future, alluding to a time of mindless violence. In the process, Neil reversed the generation gap phenomenon of the 1960s, 
placing a now elderly population in line to reverse the damages done by an over-reliance upon youthful energy with its impatient susceptibility to trends. Neil disparaged the use of hippie stereotypes for his cultists where he had envisioned more of a cycle gang variety of thugs. <laughs> Director Piers Haggard seized upon what he called Neil's reassertion of the importance of people, ordinary people, in fighting evil. Quatermass here, Professor Bernard Quatermass. Now listen to me, I've got one survivor. We've managed to get her into intensive care. At least some attempted it. John Mills embodies ideally Neil's new interpretation of Quatermass as a weary but nonetheless resourceful battler, however lacking in the authority he once had wielded. I don't think he even knew they were there. An ominous musical score by Nick Rowley emphasizes the philosophical contemplative approach. Neil's innovative reimagining aside, his narrative voice conveys an embittered and reactionary tone, as opposed to his forward-thinking outlook of the three original Quatermass outings. All of which should put paid to our coverage of the Quatermass Trilogy Plus One. In the span of a generation, Nigel Neal and his affiliated directors and actors had crystallized a shifting perspective on space exploration that may reveal more about the purported final frontier than any number of learned scientific treatises or imaginative space opera motion pictures, and without ever setting foot off planet Earth for that matter. These first two serials and their big screen adaptations were influential in their day to the extent of inspiring such similarly conceived, though shallower, motion pictures as Robert Day's First Man into Space from 1959, Quentin Lawrence's The Trollenberg Terror, 1958, and Ivan Tor's production of Riders to the Stars from 1954. Green, Reichenheim, Karun, this is Quatermus, Quatermus. We can hear you, can you hear us? Over. Bernard Quatermass had evolved from an aggressive rocketeer, wary but hopeful, into a cynical fatalist who at length comprehends that his self-sacrificing career must become a literal self-sacrifice in order to lay to rest the demons, whether figurative or literal, that his ventures have summoned. Seldom has the concept of existential man been so succinctly brought to a palpable state of being, or eventual non-being as the case may be. No mere relic of science fiction past, the Quatermass phenomenon remains provocative and thoughtful in the extreme, at the ready to give up its secrets and invite new interpretations with every viewing. For Cinema Force, I am Mike Price, signing off for now.